when I talk to some of the people of the things that they experience, I'm like, wow. Like if I feel this way from what I experience, I cannot even imagine. And it makes me yeah. sick to think about because there are horror stories that I will straight up say are like 10 times anything that I had have gone through. We just need the change. Like we have to, yeah. we have to change this industry because what you went through, what I went through, what we went through together and what all these people are going through, that is not okay. Yeah. Like, I'm, this isn't just like little love is blind. This is like every. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Eyes Wide Open, part two of the Nick Thompson and Danielle Rule conversation. Today, we pick up the day after our wedding, which was where we ended last time. And we talk about everything from integrating our lives together, our mental health throughout that entire process, what it was like anticipating the show coming out, some of the things that we experienced and went through in our life. We also talk about what it was like during the show, getting ready to film the reunion, why we filmed the reunion, why we did after the altar, some of the struggles that we face both together and individually all the way through our divorce. And then we will also close by talking about what our relationship status is right now. And um, this is a, this was a really tough one. And I think this is a little bit um, tougher now because while we did have some obvious struggles with production, we're going to talk about what actually went on in our life together. So hopefully this interview helps shed some light on both the behind the scenes of a reality show, but also the behind the scenes of our marriage in the public light and some of the things that we were experiencing so that this can help you go through life with your eyes wide open. Welcome to part two of my interview with Danielle Rule, also known as my ex-wife. And we are <laughs> going to pick up exactly where we left off at the last time. So if you haven't listened to the last episode, go and check that out because you will learn about everything we experienced pre, during, all the way up to our wedding and our wedding day and decision. Now we're going to hop back in to being dropped back into reality without any idea how to live our lives in a normal setting. So thank you for coming back and continuing this conversation. You're welcome. <laughs> Is that to me or to the viewers? To you. Oh, you're welcome, ex-husband. So we are married. And I I like to, I know we talk about this, but when you're in this in this show, you're in a very controlled environment. They are telling you where to go. They're telling you a lot of times what to talk about. Um, they're cueing conversations. They put you in scenarios you may or may not ever be in in your real life. But then all of a sudden you get married, there's wedding footage and they're just gone like halfway through the wedding reception. We didn't even know if we were allowed to cut our cake and had to add, we asked for our producer to come and tell us it was okay to cut the cake. What do you think when you think back to us just being sort of put back in reality and all the cameras are gone and all the manufactured situations are gone and we're just, left to fend for ourselves i don't know it was like alternate universe i can't even try to put my body back into that place because it already makes my like insides feel like they're in a blender it was i remember we made plans the first night outside of filming to go to a restaurant that we had both wanted to go to together that we talked about in the pods and we had a whole list of things that we were going to go yeah. do and um you know we went to to dinner and stuff and we're back working and then it's just like you you just don't even know like what to do because you have the last seven weeks have just been organized for you and you're you know I, I know we both had like weddings and friends and birthdays and family gatherings and we had no idea like how to navigate now being married and having no. expectations on that marriage and people also having opinions on that marriage good and bad yeah. you know based on how you did it 
it was just, it was brutal. Like I just remember yeah. being like crawling in my skin so much of the time. It's like people were mad at you for saying yes. People were mad at me for saying yes. Um, everyone having certain opinions of each other and us together along with us still trying to figure everything out. And, and, and that's like after it aired, right? And like after filming, I was... I'm thinking even after filming, not even after it aired. That's not, yeah, I yeah. know. Like after, you're right. Like after filming, I was, again, like that was when I like was really in the lowest. Yeah. Because I was already convinced by every single interview I had that I didn't deserve your love or, you know, I'm not the person who I thought I was my entire life. So I just felt like I was empty, like yeah. empty. I know we were talking about this the other day, but I even like, I wouldn't go around my friends that much because I was like, I asked them, um, Lauren, Rebecca, and Eileen, I was like, why are you guys friends with me? Like, you guys do so much for me because I needed like even extra emotional support. I was like, like, I feel like I don't deserve you guys. I was just like, same with my sister. I was like, oh my God, like, you're such a good person. Like, how did I end up like this way? And and again, I, I didn't feel this way before I was told that I should feel this way. I never questioned my friendships or whether I should have them. I never questioned my family life and whether or not I deserve my family. Like I just was, I, and we're just married and you think you should be happy and we're done filming and you feel like you should feel free. But I still like, I was lost. I was yeah. lost with you. I was lost with myself. I was lost with everything. And you, even though I already know. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard to hear that sometimes because I, I really do think. I know. Sometimes I think things might have been a little different if we didn't, if we had some support and we weren't in such a. I know. Hostile, <laughs> hostile environment. Um, I know. It took me. I'm still not myself. I don't know. And we and we talked about this too. And there, it's going to be a different version of myself, but. I'm finally getting back to where I was before all of this and remembering like who I actually am and now what other people think or want me to be. And it's just like, man, if I was that from day one and you met that person. I did meet that person. I know. It just, it sucks. Well, to we don't have to get into yeah. that stuff. No, it just, uh, I mean, it sucks. Cause what it did to you, what it did to me and what it did to us, like neither of us, separate or together should have been in that environment um, where we weren't supported and where we, we were actually the opposite of supported. And that's yeah. what makes it, that's what makes it so hard to think about yeah. and reflect on. And so, yeah, getting back, like getting back to reality for me was hard because, you know, you're trying to navigate a, a new marriage, like a legally binding marriage. And it's next to, I mean, it's next to impossible or it felt next to impossible yeah. at times. And we had, it was, you know, uh, uh, turbulence, but also the best times in the world. Like I've, I've said this before, like I've never had more fun in my life with anyone than I have mm. with you. And, you know, the times that we, you know, we did that and we try, I mean, we tried, we tried so hard to like, you know, duplicate the things that worked for us and eliminate the things that don't, but without guidance, like you, that's too short mm -hmm. of a time. It takes months sometimes for people to even go into a yeah. relationship, let alone be married. And, you know, and getting married at the worst possible mental space you've ever been in. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know how to deal with myself, let alone expect someone else to like know how to navigate that with me. And, and same with you, you were going through your stuff too. And it's just like when you're both in this low after going through the same experience. And like, you're trying to help yourself, let alone try and help the other person. It's like, and let alone work on a relationship, which under normal circumstances is hard as hell too. Yeah. It's like, you already have that foundation. Yeah. You aren't starting right away at the lowest possible place you felt in a gajillion years. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was tough. It was very tough. And then, you know, you're sitting there and we didn't know when the show was going to come out. We didn't know. Oh, yeah, no, we didn't. I mean, we speculated a lot. Then the new after the altar for season one came out and we were like, oh, is that going to be, 
the announcement of season two? Does that mean it's coming in? The, like, you don't know. And then you don't find out really until a few weeks <laughs> before week. it airs. Yeah. yeah. And then there's all these rules that come around with that too, which is you can't be seen in public. You, you can't be, you can follow each other on social, but you can't be in any content. You can't. So then you, you got to like be careful of who's following who from families and friends and, and then, you know, the infamous Venmo transaction fiasco. Yeah, there's all sorts of, <laughs> so people were looking at our Venmos, trying to see who was Venmoing who um, from the show. So I Venmoed you for something and they're like, well, Danielle Venmoed Nick for something in this day, but then Nick Venmoed Tom for drinks. Was it celebratory drinks or was it sad Broken going heart. out the boy drinks? Yeah, it was like a whole thing. <laughs> it's like so insane. funny. Like <laughs> so much speculation. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know this. We were not allowed to be seen in public for what three or four weeks, right? But we went out the night before they announced the cast. It was a Monday night. They announced the cast on a Tuesday. And then you're not allowed to be seen together. So we were just kind of starting to live together, I think, at that point. Or we were moving in that direction. But I yeah. mean, we spent so much time, you know, together that it, it was, you know, formality at that point for the most part. But um, we were like trying to figure out a marriage that wasn't even a year old, navigate the struggles that we had. And then we couldn't be seen in public. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't, we couldn't go out to dinner. We couldn't do, and we, you know, we did a lot of date nights. Like we tried to have time that we went out on dates. So like we couldn't do any of that stuff. And then you're just sitting there like stewing in your own juices. We went to a Bulls game. We wore a uh, Benny the Bull mask. We did do that. That was fun. <laughs> That was fun. That was a little nerve wracking, but I know, but we had the masks on. Yeah. We went to the water park and we went to the water park. There were people that had started to notice us and the show was yeah. just airing. Cause we were anxious about the show to air obviously. And I just wanted to get out. I was like, I don't want to be in Chicago. I don't want to have my phone. I already know that I can't handle this. So we went to the Wisconsin Dells with our best friends so that we wouldn't watch it we combined wouldn't we'd be distracted group. yeah combined friend group yes my all of my best friends all of his best friends we went to the dells together and to stay away from everything and still then it was literally the day the weekend that the show aired people were like is that them i'm like what already <laughs> then the show came out and i mean we were basically trapped in our house together or yeah. I, I actually don't remember if you like went to your mom's or anything anymore, but I remember we were kind of trapped here with the looming reunion. The reunion is, so the reunion, you go film after, literally the day after the last episode drops. You don't, and by the way, you don't get to see it ahead of time. You don't know your quote edit, and I did air quotes for anyone listening. You don't know anything. You don't know really what happens or what the edit's going to say happened. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to navigate this new public life. You're trying to navigate people's thoughts and opinions on your relationship. What were those couple of weeks? I mean, I know, but like, let's talk about those couple of weeks and what they were like. I didn't leave. The <laughs> I didn't leave the house. I wouldn't. I like, I like was a man. I, I, I was like nothing. I know. Like I always say, like I was, I felt like a shell watching myself from a, like my life from afar, not actually living it. And that's why I didn't like, that's when I really, really was like, I don't deserve anything. I don't want to be in public. I, if I'm not smiling all the time, am I going to fit the narrative who people think I am, even though usually I'm a very like bubbly person when I meet new people. And, and it just, I, I isolated, like I completely isolated because I was scared to even be around anyone, even the people who loved me, because I thought that they shouldn't. That's awful. All right. Yeah, I remember you did not want to leave the couch, let alone the house. Yeah. It was, it was really, you know, it was heartbreaking to, to see someone you love struggling to get off the couch. Like, it's, yeah, and that was another one. Like, I did not know... 
I didn't know what to do. This was new to both of us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, it's kind of almost like the structure we had that we were trying to build upon. We couldn't even do because we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't go on our date nights. We couldn't do any of that. It was really hard. Yeah, yeah. it was hard. And it's just like on top of that, well, one, when we were going on our date nights, we would be interrupted. I remember our anniversary even. We couldn't even have a conversation with one another because we were getting like all of these other people were interrupting and it was just sad. And and not and you know, and it's like, you know, it's not sad in a way where they like they were excited to meet us. It's just like, wow, this is different. And on top, like another thing is like the way that I interpret or experience hate is different than you. And so also like having to, in a short period of time, try and put yourself in the other person's shoes. That's hard too, where it's like, okay, you're getting this. Well, you're not even comfortable in your own shoes because you're not used to having hundreds of thousands of people commenting on you, your relationship, your family, your behaviors, your job. It was wild. Yeah. And no it's support. It's just like all of these different things that like, we like we can't even like wrap our heads around, let alone even like any contract. <laughs> like we had a great couples therapist, but like even like imagine that it's like well I don't know like it's just like a it, it's like no one no. can like understand the, the level of impact that that yeah. can have. People are people don't really understand, and that's okay. And people project. So there's a lot of people out there that I think are. I don't know if jealous is the right word, but like when they're like, oh, you signed up for this or, oh, why'd you stay? Or, oh, like, I think there's a little bit of them thinking like, I should have had this opportunity. I would have been better at it. I would have survived it better. I would have navigated better. So there's all sorts of weird stuff going on there with that. But like the fact people are like, why didn't you leave? Or why did you film after the altar? Why did you go to the reunion? And, you know, we went to the reunion and up until it was a game time call if we were actually going to participate. Yeah. Remember like, so we had, we had like two, actually two couples therapists. We had Michael and we had Lise and we were mentally preparing ourselves. I forgot about for the that. Reunion. We had tried, we yeah. had gone through four because finding it's hard. It's hard to find the right one. Yeah. Yeah. But like the, the sessions with Michael were like, what, freaking eight hours. Yeah. And we would go and we would practice like, okay, how are we going to navigate going here? Knowing that it's going to be going into a re-triggering environment. Mm-hmm. And we would talk about it with our other couple therapists that we would meet weekly. And, and it was just like, we literally spent so much time trying to mentally prepare together for the reunion. So it's not like we just like, Oh, please let me go to the reunion. Like we didn't, we didn't want to go. And I texted like everyone from Netflix and kinetic saying, I, I can't do this. And they're like, um, you know, it'll change your narrative X, Y, and Z. So we still flew to LA and the day of the reunion and night. not together, by the way, you don't, oh, you, yeah, you can't fly, fly together. together. Yeah. So we had different cars, yeah. different airports, different airlines. Um, so it wasn't like we were able to ha- sit down and have a yeah. deep conversation about it. But it's like even weeks, months, days leading up to it. I was like, I don't think I can do it. Uh, I can do it. I, I, and I was just like in this battle in my head of trying to figure out whether or not I could mentally handle it. And my aunt had died due to addiction like right before like pretty early on and she was like so excited to watch this experience and we I was just like freaking out in the bathroom I remember I was like having like a like a mini panic attack where I just had to like close the was it under the bathroom sink or in the bath I don't know like I was somewhere weird where I just had to like be in an enclosed space and we decided, like, I was like, no, I freaked out on my producer and was like, I can't do this, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I will give you all of the questions that we will ask. And so Nick and I went to brunch and we sat there with our questions and we're like, fine, like, we'll do it if this is exactly what happens. And we are leaving if anything goes awry. And so people are like, one, why do you go to the reunion? It's we didn't want to. We decided last second because we told them that they had to do it the way that we wanted it because we didn't want to go. We are contractually bound to do it too. So there is yeah. that risk that they're going to, they're going to, you know, come. That's always, yeah. In the back of your head. It's like, you have to do this. And then a sub subsequential or sub, what is the word? Like three to four episodes yeah. after. So that's in there. Cause I actually got a note from my psychiatrist um, just in case 
saying that I like wasn't, you know, I needed to not participate in this other stuff. Lise wrote us something too, right? Our couples therapist. No, my psychiatrist wrote it and Lise looked at it to make sure that it was persuasive enough to let us get out of contract. Okay. Yeah. So our couples therapist like literally wrote a note for my psychiatrist and was like, I guess should be more persuasive. But yeah, it's like, we didn't want to go. Like you just feel like you're so like, you feel like you don't have a decision to or not to until now looking back, it's like, we should have just fucking said no. Yeah. Well, I look back on it too. And I remember like in the moment, I didn't really care about the reunion. I didn't care about after out there. I cared about like you and us. And I just wanted whatever was, whatever you needed to do, I was fine with. And I didn't want to, I didn't care if we went, like I've never cared about any of the, you know, fame or, or clout or any of that. I just wanted to make it work with you. And I didn't know if going was going to be the best thing for that. I also didn't know if staying out, sitting out was going to be the best yeah. thing for that. It, it's impossible to know for either of us, let alone together. And the thing is, honestly, like it did work out better. Like the fact that we did it, like the fact that we said, we're not going to do it unless you do X, Y, and Z. And they did say, we'll change your narrative. You'll come out looking better. And we did. So it's like, yeah, retroactively, I don't regret doing the reunion or after the altar, but I'm glad that we stated how, you know, how bad like the impacts were mentally so that they changed it, you know? The thing too with after the altar is we actually got to plan a lot of that. I wouldn't say we didn't do yeah. the planning, planning, but we influenced a lot of what we were going to do. Mm-hmm. Like they came to us and were like, what are you guys thinking for would be fun for after the altar? And, um, you know, we came up with like, oh, we should throw a party to have, uh, get all the cast back together. And, um, you know, we should theme it because this is stuff we do with our friends and actually have done with some cast mm-hmm. members before. And so we came up with the eighties theme for after the altar. So the diff, they did follow through on that. Like the experience on After the Altar was mm-hmm. totally different. Some could argue that that's because you have a platform now and, you know, you could, um, you know, you have you have a place to speak. So they have to treat you a little bit better. But um, yeah, yeah I, I actually think After the Altar was a better representation of oh, yeah. at least of at least of like the positive parts of our relationship like i i didn't think we got many of those even the like the whole costume scene in the original was edited with dramatic music and we were literally being sarcastic that's a funny thing so you're the one who told them that i have costumes in the closet right like you're the one oh go look in her closet see what she has and then you're the one who was like go put it on make her put it on and you were totally fine with putting it on and then we're sitting in my air conditioning broke in my apartment and we're sitting there in my apartment, which is like I got we hot. Had really bad luck. We had really bad luck when it comes to heat. We're sitting there on my couch and, and they're trying to force a, I'm not allowed to say that. There was a conversation we didn't want to have. I'll put it that way. And we just like, we're like, get us out of this hot ass apartment. And that's when you were like, He's, I'm taking this off. I'm warm. It had nothing to do with the costumes. He's like, how do you feel about the tables? I don't care. How do you feel about those tables? I don't care. How do you feel about these? Oh, okay, fine. I'll say it. None of it matters when I pass out from heat stroke. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't care about this. Just let me get out of this damn hot apartment. It was, yeah, it was. Fun. But then the music, like the editing with the music. And I, <laughs> Uh, I'm very sarcastic and very dry. So like a lot of the stuff that I was saying was just sarcastic and dry. It's so yeah, that, that was weird, but I do feel like it, it kind of showcased like another side of our relationship that you didn't see in the original. The more normal. Yeah. Yeah. The part that wasn't manufactured in a sense. Yeah. If they would have seen our first night in Mexico and the dance parties we were having, game over, you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was like after the ultra on steroids. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe they have that footage somewhere from those cameras that might have been in the room. Oh yeah, they do have that. <laughs> so we did so we did all of this, and this is after the altar was filming, right after the show came out. So we were just all mm-hmm. in the public eye, being in a relationship, having all the commentary on the relationship. I know like I didn't see as much of it. I was pretty busy at work. Um, not that you weren't, but we had a product launch coming up that I was just in meetings all day for. I didn't, so I didn't see a lot of it, but I mean, having people who saw an hour and 15 minutes of your relationship 
comment and have commentary on your relationship when it's highly edited and there's thousands of hours on the floor, that is the most uncomfortable, frustrating situation because you just don't have any control over it. No. People are reaching out to my family. Yeah. Like people were talking shit to my mom about me, telling me that I should kill myself. And my mom's sister just died. I was like, really? Like, God, like, and that's the thing. It's like, it impacts your family. Like yeah. people, like if you don't respond to people's messages, then they go to every single other person that they, is going to relate to you. And unfortunately they did, but it's just like, look what I got. Look what I got. Cause they're not used to that either. And it's just like, it's just yeah, sad. It's, it's, it's fucking insane the links that people go to. Yeah. When your marriage is in the public eye and like we were known for it, like that's people didn't know Danielle or Nick or Danielle and Nick, they knew an hour and 15 minutes that they saw on TV. And that is again, like highly edited, but like it's, I, I just remember things people would say, be like, that's not our f fucking relationship. Like, what are you talking about? It, it's, yeah. Yeah, it, it, so it's so damaging to have people comment on that, and then the pressure of of that. You alluded to it a little earlier when you said, you know, you started to almost believe the things that people were saying because it's like propaganda. You hear it so much, and we're wired to focus on the negative. That's just human nature. Yeah. And if it, there's like a million people saying it, I don't know a million know. people, right? So more people are saying I'm bad than I've ever known good. And they don't know me. So I like, you know, like, obviously, like, I had to like retrain my brain, but I'm like, oh, you know, like, I've never heard this many people tell me I'm good. So this many people are telling me I'm bad must be right. And I would ask my psychiatrist, I have this, don't I? No, I have this, don't I? I think I need to be on this medication. Everyone's telling me that. I'm like, Danielle, stop. Like, that is, that is something I've talked a little bit about with like other doctors or psychologists, therapists and stuff. It's like, what the hell is with people diagnosing people? Like, and I, I feel silly because I've said this to you before, but I had like six friends and we were all good. Like, of course we all have our own stuff, but I yeah. feel like this whole show and this whole experience has exposed me to like the damage of so many people, so many people have unresolved trauma. So many yeah. people are suffering out there and it like breaks my heart in a lot of ways. And I think that when someone comes and they're like calling you, you know, whatever, all every diagnosis in the DSM five, they put on you at some point and, or they call you like people throw around the word narcissist, like narcissism is a very serious like mental illness and it actually ruins people's lives on, on a lot of different ways. And to just throw this stuff around, like you're yeah. a doctor or you have the skill set or the understanding because you saw a meme somewhere of what it looks like to be, you know, to have, be bipolar or like, it's so damaging, not only to people in the public eye, but to somebody who so people want, like reading the messages. Yeah. Like imagine having bipolar disorder or something like that. And then they have someone throwing it on someone as an insult. That's no, someone young who was like, you know, I haven't been to therapy. I don't feel comfortable talking to my mom. I really related to you on the show. Everyone's telling me that you have this and I feel like I relate to you. So I think I have this and I'm just like, there's nothing wrong with having that. But like now there's people who relate to me that are diagnosing themselves based on the people diagnosing me. And it's just like this. And the people, you know, and it, the people diagnosing you aren't mental health professionals. No, exactly. And that's what's so sad. That's what's so sad. Like, it doesn't only impact me, like, yeah. or you, or like, you know, there's, there's other people who, like, are damaged by people just fucking throwing out these terms. I remember when we were at the iHeart um, I Heart Music Awards, which were... <laughs> funny story like do you remember we were standing there and someone came up to say hi and then there were people and we thought we were like blocking them but it was actually a line of people that wanted to meet us <laughs> do you that remember that so weird yeah i was, I was like, like oh let's get out of their way yeah we're blocking people and they're like no they're all here to meet you but um that so that was a real eye-opening moment but there was a girl there who was I, I don't remember she was a teenager maybe early 20s and she said something similar to you unless that's the person you're talking about but i remember she came up and yeah. she was like i'm never comfortable talking about this and hearing you talk about it has helped me talk to my parents about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like those messages are what makes it worth it, you know?
yeah or those people that come up to me in person because she was like like in tears and i was like oh my gosh that was the first time that i had you know seen someone like in person impacted by it and i was like wow this is like yeah it's powerful yeah it's really impactful i actually had that happen a few months back where i was just walking and this guy stopped and he was like he I assumed he had recognized me just by the way he like looked at me as he walked by. And then he he walked ahead and I stopped and I got coffee and then he was kind of still out there a little bit ahead. And then finally he just turned around and came back and he was like, thank you for talking about men's mental health. You've helped me so much. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. oh, and he was shaking and he was like, it's just so nice to meet you. I'm so grateful for you. And it's like, yeah, that is, that is like the positive impact you can have if you decide that you want to use your platform for good instead of monetization. Yeah, <laughs> which exactly you can also do both, but you can actually be relatable and show people on a bigger scale and on a bigger platform that they are not alone. And that is, yeah. I think what, you know, I'm proud of you for doing and I'm, I'm, you know, so excited to see the impact that you have on people. It's, and even seeing it, oh, you know, yeah. when we were together yeah. and stuff, it's, it's very moving to see how much of a difference it makes because it's also relatable. Yeah. I mean, I just talk about me, you know, it's like, I don't have any advice for anyone else. I just talk about my experiences and, and the way that I would to friends, you know, I don't know how to influence. I don't know how to take a picture of a really nice looking meal. I don't know how to like wear an outfit or put it clothes together, but you, <laughs> so I just talk about, hold on a second. You don't know how to wear an outfit or come on. I wear the same jeans, black tank top with a different overcoat jacket over it. Yeah. And you know that. I know. <laughs> but I've also seen plenty of photos because people have already noticed, but we followed each other again on social media. I don't know how many messages you've gotten about it. I've gotten a ton. Um, I, again, I don't know how people think to do that why they do that <laughs> how do but, people um, do, already people notice that oh yeah you haven't gotten well maybe you have i know i haven't looked yeah yeah so it's so it's but anyway on that note so i i have seen your profile mm -hmm. now for the first time in seven months or so and there's definitely some outfits and some nice photos on there so don't Ooh. don't say you don't know how to dress up <laughs> <laughs> That's when I'm like, oh, I have to think of something spicy. And I look on Pinterest and I buy the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no influencer life for me. Yeah. We're both in the same camp. Yeah, exactly. More, um, more real life, building a real life community. So yeah. my question now for you, not even question, something I want us to talk about. So we were, we did after the altar. It didn't come out yet and we separated and i mean we don't have to get into like a, you know all of the details but like doing that in the public eye was the hardest thing i've done in my entire life and i'm still reeling from it like to this yeah. day of what that was like so like I'm not going to like take the whole narrative here, but like, I know if my experience was I got the paperwork and I was processing it for lack of a better word. Um, and then TMZ leaks it a few days later, I had told a handful of my closest friends and I had told my boss because it happened like while I was in a meeting with him and, um, and he, he kind of knew the situation cause he could tell I wasn't the same and I wanted to just keep him informed. And, um, <clears throat> he, you know, he, he was very supportive and everything, but like, other than that, I hadn't told my family yet. Um, I hadn't told anyone. So like waking up, I think it was a Sunday morning that morning. Actually, I know it was a Sunday morning. Wake up that morning to calls from my mom, my friends, yeah. texts, DMS, people sending me the story, all of that stuff. It was awful. I, I was in, and then of course, because my life is ironic, I went to get dinner and drinks with my friends that night after I talked to my mom, talked to my sisters, all that stuff. And I see 
Rebecca and Will at the Irish Nobleman, which is our <laughs> a, a spot we went to. So it's like that day to see them and then to like, yeah. It, it, so it was just like a, the day is one of the worst days of my entire life. It was just awful. So what was, you know, that's my experience. What was yours like that day? Horrible. I didn't talk to anyone. I don't think I was able to talk to anyone that day, to be honest. Cause that it just, I don't know. It didn't even feel real that. Because again, it goes back to feeling like a shell and watching your life from afar and not living it. Like, so I think that I disassociated so much in order to cope that I tried to feel empty and just looked at it as if it was someone else's life and not mine. And I, <clears throat> I, I didn't talk to anyone about it, like, except my really close knit group of friends and my parents and my sister. And most of my family didn't reach out. A lot of my friends didn't reach out. But part of me was like, is it because they, I didn't reach out to them. And then I, I realized that a lot of them don't even have social media. Like my grandma found out on the Today Show and I'm super close to my grandma. And that broke my heart. She was like, hey, didn't show up to voice. And I'm like, hey, Danielle, like, I, I just saw you on the news and I just want to see if you're okay. Like I saw you on the Today Show and I was just like, shit. Like, I didn't even think about, you know, we don't have, we didn't have the time to like communicate. I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing about being in the public eye. Like you're not on, you're on their timeline. Yeah. You know, I, I feel I can relate. Like I felt for months like life was happening to me and I was just forced to respond and react to it. And I, I very much take control and responsibility for my life. Like I, I generally, like not all the time, generally I try to do that. And that was just so hard because I'm like, this stuff is just happening and I don't have any control. Yeah. Like we didn't get to control the narrative. We didn't get to control anything because TMZ went with it. And, um, yeah. you know, and part of that, I, I will take responsibility. Like part of that's my fault. I didn't want to accept it. I wasn't ready for it and I didn't know how to respond and I didn't know what I needed in the moment either. And I, I didn't know anything. So it, it was, you know, I, I take responsibility for that, but it was just so hard. It was hard. Yeah. And I want to ask you like, I just thought of this while you were talking. Um, what do you, so now you have all of these opinions coming from everybody, <laughs> like yeah. literally fans of the show, um, our friends and family, all of this stuff going on. Like, how did you, how did you like go through that? Like, how did you experience that? How did you like, take all that because everybody had like people come out with opinions that like you never know they really had that people come out and everybody wants yeah. the tea a little bit too and because it's because it's public people don't necessarily treat it like it's real yeah so how did you know that's what i was that? thinking yeah like a lot of people didn't have sympathy or empathy because of the fact that we met in the way that we did and they didn't understand how serious the feelings were um, and of course the opinions sucked. Like there's people who are like, Danielle deserves better. Nick deserves better. And you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just like everything. It's just people that were happy, happy that there were two so people... many people happy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the part that it's so hard. And, you know, I think about, I, and I haven't thought about this in a while, but like, I felt like people weren't taking it seriously. And that's no. not just the public. Like, I didn't think, I mean, there were moments, this is going to sound horrible. There were moments where I literally felt like no one cared. Like no one yeah. thought it was a loss. No one thought I was grieving. And it wasn't until I had um, Steph Sarazen, who, who had a horrible marriage experience. She was an author. She was on my show. It wasn't until I like talked to her. And we became friends and she's been a great resource. But like, it wasn't until I talked to her that I actually felt like anyone understood how hard this was to grieve someone that you thought you were spending your life with and that you wanted to spend your life with and that you truly loved. And just because it was on TV, it's like, it's not real. Yeah. And you start no, to like... I had friends, yeah. Family, like none of them, I don't think. But also like, I didn't talk to them, so... You know, I didn't open up to them. I was kind of like hiding from it. I still haven't opened up to a lot of people that 
but even like now, you know, like when I have felt like, oh yeah, like this is how it impacted me. There's still people where it's like, that's your public life. I'm like, no, that's like my real life. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I know I took it very seriously. I think you did too. Um, yeah, it's. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like that was the thing that was hardest is like people that I know personally and some of them I hadn't, you know, I was so busy. I, there were some of my best friends who like didn't, who weren't there or who didn't understand the impact that it actually had. Because again, like they, I don't know. They watched it on TV. They watched an hour and 15 yeah. minutes of it on TV and they think they know everything. Yeah. That was really hard. And then processing all of that and. Of course, there's the interviews and the, like, I avoided it for a long time and said no comment for a long time because um, I thought it was, you know, it was a private matter. I wasn't ready to talk about it, but it was, um, yeah, it was very, it's very traumatic and it's not even because of the, I mean, it's partially because of the hate, at least for me, it's partially because of the way people are commenting on your relationship when they have no idea what it was actually like or what, or, you know, how much we loved each other. And yeah, it was just, it's still a loss. It's still a loss. It was still, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm still, I still feel it, you know, it's, yeah. it's some, and we're going to be connected forever, whether, yeah. <laughs> whether we decide we want to be or not. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. So, um, we both left reality TV land, right? So, I, I had, I've talked a little bit about this. I had a very long, um, interview over the course of two days back in December about the whole process from beginning to end. And I was anonymous for, um, actually Dr. Isabel was writing an article, uh, who's the, uh, mental director of mental health at the UCAN foundation. She was writing an article about the abuse that she was witnessing watching love is blind season three, I believe she wanted to talk to past contestants. So I agreed to do it anonymously. We talked for, I think it was about three hours and I went from beginning to end. And that moment for me was like, eye opening to the point of like, holy shit, there's been a lot that's happened. And it was a, it was a, it was one, it, you know, it was probably the worst day of my life, at least so far. And, um, you know, I felt completely, I was lost. I was like, I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know what happened. I don't know how this happened. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? I thought I was spending it with you and that's, you know, gone. I lost my family that I gained, which, you know, I'm, you know, I love your family and, and I miss them and, and I like being around them. And, you know, I always felt so welcomed and loved and just this whole life that we had that we were going to build together. And I just felt like I'm never going to have that. And it, even if I did, it would never be the same as what we were. And it was just this heartbreaking moment. Um, I don't know if I'm not trying to get you to talk about any moment of my, I, I say my never ending quest for rock bottom was finally completed that day. And, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, it, it, so it, my point is it was hard and I decided in that moment there was, I went dark on social media for over a week, um, to get through the holidays and to get through the new year for the most part. And I had very serious conversations with my therapist about just deleting all my social media and completely just throw, th acting like none of it ever happened. Talk about like your exit from the spotlight or whatever you want to say. What prompted you to do that? What did that look like for you? Um, I know for me it was I'm going to really post a lot more about how I'm feeling um, in the moment and the lessons I'm learning and going through this process because it fucking sucked. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of, a lot of it was hard to come to that conclusion. So I'm curious when you decided to leave the spotlight, I guess, for lack of a better word. I just, I was like trying to keep up and I was comparing myself to all of my girlfriends and I would post these or try and like film these things. And I just like, it was so unauthentic. 
And I just was like, I give up, you know, like I'm just going to post in the way that I do my, with my friends. And I am going to focus on my career. Like I freaking love my job and my personal life outside of like the show, my friends, my family, like my career, they're doing great. So why am I like stressed about social media? I shouldn't be, you know? Yeah. And so I had just like completely, I was like, I don't know how to use TikTok. I don't even watch TikTok. I'm not going to sit here over here trying to look at TikTok trends. So I just post about how I'm feeling and, and that's what resonates with people. And that's what's important to me is like focusing what I have on social media towards mental health and then spending the, the rest of my time with my friends, my family and, and my job. And that's what makes me a lot happier than trying to force myself to fit into something that's going to make me money. Like I have a job, you know, like I can fend for myself. Yeah, that's yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That my whole philosophy was like, go back to reality, go back to the reality yeah. that works for you. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> and then, <laughs> then Business Insider. Yeah. <laughs> what was your uh, process with that? Deciding to do that, put yourself back in that space. I didn't think it was going to impact me as much as it did because I feel like me neither since even even before the the rest of the episodes aired I was so triggered by the way that they misrepresented Mexico and the things that I lived through in Mexico that I had been talking about that in interviews or even on my social media if you go back months ago like I've been talking about this stuff and then I was like finally there's a way for this to actually get heard so at the time talking to the reporter it felt therapeutic then it came out and I was like, wow, I'm reliving this publicly again, and I can't deal with it. But then the amount of people who reached out from other shows um, made me want to keep talking about it, even though it was like kind of still hurting myself. But Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, uh, I initially didn't respond. I didn't think about it. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to do it. I was like, this is not part of my identity anymore. And then the more I thought about it and I was like, I have nothing to lose, but there's a lot of misrepresentation and going through the articles, actually what prompted me to agree to, you know, help and join and found the, the, you can foundation. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I said this already, but when I went through all of that again, <laughs> from start to finish and what happened in Mexico and what it did to you and what it did to me and the role that I felt like it played with where we were in our lives. And I didn't know where you were, but like I knew where you were before I didn't know where you were. And I was just like, I have to do something. And if this article is going to really be like an expose and be more than just you and me yeah. bitching and complaining about this, then I have to do it because it's the right thing to do. Even yeah. though I didn't, I was so terrified of just being back in that world. And yeah. honestly, like being like the only way it worked for me is out of sight, out of mind and yeah. just seeing you again. And yeah it's, yeah, it's like having our names connected in every single article and in every single news outlet when we hadn't talked for God knows how long. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, that was that was tough. Yeah, that week was really hard. That week was very very hard. It, it, it was more than a week. I was like, "What was?" Oh, I mean, it's still going now? on. I know. Yeah, I mean, it's easier now that we're still talking, or that we're talking yeah. now. I think it was a lot harder when it's like, okay, we're literally supporting each other without talking to one another, and you're the only person I want to talk to. So I that know. made it even harder to live through and it's still you know hard regardless because you're talking about traumatic events you're talking with other people who experience this stuff behind the scenes without having the voice to do so or you know being scared until we did and it's just like this pile of emotions of like mine yours ours together the hundreds of people who have reached out to us separately it's just like a lot to take on when you've tried moving on from the everything I couldn't agree more. The people reaching out, I continue to invite it. I, it is yeah. hard to oh, yeah. read because you, you know, you realize that behind your incident, there's a hundred more people that have gone through it too. And maybe worse in some cases, maybe better. And it's just so hard. When I talk to some of the people of the things that they experience, I'm like, wow, 
Like if I feel this way from what I experience, I cannot even imagine. And it makes me yeah. sick to think about because there are horror stories that I will straight up say are like 10 times anything that I had have gone through. And I'm, you know, like I'm not trying to discredit myself, but like I, it's just no, like you, people were to like read this stuff. I know. Oh, it's like well, that's insane. that's for. Yes. Please don't discount yourself or our experience. Everyone experiences things differently. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's a very fucked up thing. And. The problem is, is that this has all reality TV has escaped labor laws. Reality TV has escaped any kind of regulation. And even the shows that try to do the mental health support thing, like they're staffed by the production company who has a benefit to knowing the mental health of a contestant or a cast person or the bachelor or whomever it is. And so it's all, it's all there to, be smoke and mirrors and yeah. actually give give the show the drama. And that's why I think, you know, going through this, we just need the change. Like we have to yeah. we have to change this industry because what you went through, what I went through, what we went through together and what all these people are going through, that is not okay. Yeah. That is not okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's exploitative. Um, and it, it, it's literally like the Hunger Games. It feels like the it Hunger Games. So yeah. And this is, you know, like this isn't a, like, I'm, this isn't just like Little Love is Blind. This is like every, you know, there's like cooking shows, so many food shows. network shows, yeah. competition uh-huh. shows. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awful. Yeah. So on that, that wonderful note. <laughs> <laughs> People are going to ask, people have been asking a couple of questions. So I figured we would address them. What's next for us now that we've reconnected, we've talked through our experiences together. We've talked through some of them here and you know, what's next for us in your <laughs> mind? Like, Ooh, are you asking me on a date? <laughs> um, no, like, like it's good because we're fine. Like we're moving forward with the team. Like we've been through a lot. We've, a lot which people have probably seen um good and bad but it's like being able to have a common ground and a common goal and do it together now is you know it's, yeah it's very fulfilling yeah it's it's definitely um i agree it's so it's such a heavy lift off to have known that um I guess to to have the experience that we've had the last couple of weeks of being able to talk and spend time with these feelings and processes, some of the stuff together, and then know we have each other's back and I'll always have your back no matter what, yeah. I hope you know that. Yeah, you, it's like another cloud being lifted, you know? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it, it definitely feels like 10 times better going through it together yeah. than it, it did. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Before we wrap <laughs> up, is there anything else you want to say? And then I've got one final question. Oh man. I feel like I've said, <laughs> it's like, what did I, I like, don't even know what I haven't said at this point. <laughs> I know it's been, it's been a long time, but, um, people want to know if we still love each other. They all ask all the time. Um, <laughs> Should we like yes. say it at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I'll answer it do. first. I've admitted it before. Yes, we still love each other. Yeah, this was real. For those of you who think this was just a TV show, it Doesn't wasn't for go us. away. Yeah. No. Like you said, like we're tied together. Like in yeah. a really weird way. In a billion yeah. different ways. We are. <sighs> okay. All right. Well, <laughs> so yes, we still love each other, but, um, on that <laughs> note, <laughs> people can find you on your social media. It's all in the bio. Thank you for coming on. I do want to say one last thing. Um, you know, I, with Jeremy Hartwell and Dr. Isabel Morley formed the UCAN foundation. And our goal is to change reality TV. Uh, we want to ensure everybody, that is a future, current, or past reality star has full access to mental health services. 
and legal services so that they understand their rights, they know what they're getting into, and can have contracts and labor laws that are humane and not exploitative for the sake of entertainment. Um, and going through what we went through together, I don't want anyone to ever go through that again without any kind of support um, and any kind of mental health services. So you can foundation.org. It's a non for profit. And, um, you know, there's plenty of ways to get involved and donate if you want to support us. And we're not using funds to like, pay for rich reality stars therapy where we have, um, you know, a network of over 200 therapists that have signed up and we are helping match people um, with a therapist that's licensed in their state that is a good fit for what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, we're really going to push change in the industry. So today, um, this wasn't even about that. And I didn't even plan to say that, but I just feel compelled <laughs> after this conversation to say no one should go through this and we're going to make some change. So thank you yeah. for coming on. Thank you for being vulnerable. And this certainly was <laughs> hard for both of us. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being vulnerable. It's like yeah. awkward. It's like, I'll touch you later. <laughs> I know. Right. Right. Yeah. So, well, okay, thank you. For having me. Okay. Talk to you later. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.